Forgotten by Richard L. Slager. Most people wouldn't walk across the street to confirm a rumor. Me, I drove halfway across the country. Rumor has it that up in the hills in the backwoods of Tennessee slept an old Shelby Mustang that slumbered in the squalor of a once magnificent dwelling, a mansion that fell into disrepair and decay for the last several decades. No one lived there anymore, and the talk about this old Shelby Mustang became the talk of legend to those who cared enough about such things. Everyone heard about the 65, but no one had ever seen it, or rather couldn't prove that they'd seen it. I rolled into town late afternoon. I pulled my truck and trailer into the parking lot of a small restaurant. I figured I might start up some conversation with the locals in order to get more specific directions on how to get to the place that housed this car. That's the thing with rumors, they're so non-specific. It was one of those diners, the moment you stepped in, the people collectively stopped and stared, making assessments whether you were a local friendly or an outsider, possibly up to no good. When the overhead doorbell rang, people stopped their conversation and all eyes trained on me. After a brief pause, they resumed their conversation while I took a seat by the window. I picked up a menu and perused the dishes offered. The server came by and asked for my order. I had the usual fare of fast food. I wanted a fast bite of energy to blast out of here on my quest. I eased into a conversation with my server when she brought me the food. I asked her if she knew anything about an old Mustang in the area. She said she did. She claimed the car was long gone, removed from the property ages ago by some trophy hunters, yet there were still those who to this day still claim the car is up there, but no one has ever been able to prove it, and further, that anyone who claimed they saw it never wanted to go back. They say the place is haunted. I asked her for the location. She responded instinctively as if she'd been asked this question many times before, stating it was out of town, up the old road that branches off to the right, just at the town limits. I asked her for the name of the road, and she said it had no name. It was more part road and part private driveway, cutting through the woods and leading to the old house that contained this phantom Mustang. I thanked her for the information, and she walked away, shaking her head. I thought her reaction a bit disrespectful, but reconsidered, given that she'd probably been asked these questions many times before by outsiders attempting to track down this rare car. I wasted no time finishing my food and paying the bill. Before I left, the server came to me and said, I wouldn't go up there if I was you. It's not what you think. She looked at me with the most fearful eyes. I nodded to her as if to consider her admonition, and I left. I hustled to my truck and trailer and got on my way, leaving town with the directions given. At the edge of town, I saw the road as she described it. The road branched off and disappeared into a forest of trees. The road looked disused and neglected with encroaching vegetation and crumbling pavement. I signaled right and turned off, following the road that would take me to an automotive crown jewel and many accompanying speed parts according to the rumor. I checked my rearview mirror and all traces of civilization vanished behind me, while ahead it looked like another world a place left behind by the flowing current of time. The skies were black and it began to rain. I could hear droplets hitting the ripened autumn leaves in a delightful way. The woods went on for a good five minutes and I drove at residential speed, checking my odometer for reassurance. The further I went, the darker it became and soon the road crumbled to dust beneath my wheels. It wasn't until I'd driven at least a mile on a gradual uphill gradient that I saw the clearing. The rain came down in buckets now, and I activated my wipers. An old run-down mansion appeared in the offing, the road winding its way to this towering structure. I pulled up to the circular driveway and parked. The place looked tumbled down, and the massive front door hung precariously from its hinges, making for a very unwelcoming impression. Here it is, I thought. This is the place. I killed the engine, bristling with excitement at the thought of what I might find. I leaped off of the running board of my truck and scaled the stairs leading to the entranceway. I seized the door handle to the elaborately carved oak door and pulled. The door fell to the floor with a tumultuous crash. Hello? I said, foolishly expecting that the owner might still be home. I stepped over the fallen door beyond the threshold. Inside the entranceway to the foyer, I saw a shattered chandelier on the floor 
with its crystalline fragments scattered across the marble tiles. To the right, I saw a living room, cluttered with broken furniture, dust, debris, fallen wallpaper, and moldy old books. I took a step into this once graceful living room and picked up one of the books. The cover displayed a faded picture of a Shelby Mustang. Clue number one, I said. I came to the right place. My voice echoed with a haunting reverberation throughout the house. I thought I heard someone answer. I said hello in response. No answer came. The rain pounded the roof of the mansion and I could hear water infiltrating parts of the house with constant relentless drips. The occasional peal of thunder reverberated through the skies and some of the booms shook the very foundations. I walked deeper into the catacombs of this once graceful mansion and came upon a spiral staircase. Curling like a snail shell, the steps led downstairs into the dim light below. I was half inclined to go back to my truck and get a flashlight, but there seemed to be sufficient ambient light coming through the apparent basement windows. I walked down the steps and halfway is when I saw it, a white car with blue stripes squatting on flattened tires. The Shelby, I exclaimed. I ran down the remaining steps, nearly slipping on water-soaked filth and grime. I got to the bottom and saw tons of loose debris, planks of wood, gardening equipment, all of it interspersed with scattered car magazines and lots of car parts, more specifically speed parts like exotic intake manifolds and high-performance engine goodies. Natural light shined through the basement windows, allowing me a better view. The car possessed all of the visual hallmarks of a 1965 Shelby Mustang. My doubting mind questioned whether it might be a clone, as so many in the car world exist as replicas, not originals. I stepped over refuse and skirted around car parts. I got to the car door and looked inside. Through the dirt, I saw the rear gauge pod on the dash, which gave strong indication of this car's provenance. I stepped around more debris and positioned myself at the hood. The front end must have hit something a long time ago. The right headlight was smashed and some of the bodywork dented. The front bumper was missing. As for the hood, huge cracks ran the length and a chunk was missing from the fiberglass, like it had hit a post a very long time ago. I wondered if the car had hit a deer back in the day. I managed to open what remained of the hood and the hinges creaked like old bones. Underneath, I saw the silver glint of a VIN tag on the driver's inner fender apron that pointed in the direction of an honest-to-goodness Shelby Mustang. I looked at the number on the tag. The low number suggested this car to be an early one in the limited production run of Shelby Mustangs for 1965. I saw the Cobra valve covers on the engine block, the four-bolt export brace, and the Monte Carlo bar. It looked legitimate. Jackpot. I closed the hood and rushed over to the driver's side again, opening the door. A strange mist came out and wafted into the air, then disappeared. I bet that door hadn't been opened in decades, I mused. Inside the cabin, it smelled old and deathly. The driver's seat looked milky white from mildew, but that wasn't about to deter me. I sat right in the seat and closed the door. I adjusted the seat and got comfortable. I listened intently to the rain outside, but could not hear it as before. The deafening silence inside the cabin disturbed me but I dismissed it. I sat motionless and absorbed the ambience of this antiquity, this 1960s beauty. My eyes fixated on the hypnotic cobra head emblazoned on the center cap of the steering wheel. I placed my hands on the wooden three-spoke rim and imagined for a moment what it must have been like to drive this car when she was new. I pictured myself driving along a deserted highway, just me, the Shelby, and the unimpeded open road. My fingers curled comfortably around the grooves and I sank a little deeper into the seat. I went to remove my right hand and try the shifter handle, but my hand remained fixed and immovable. What is this all about? I immediately thought I might be having a seizure and my hand somehow locked up. I checked my face in the rearview mirror for any signs that I might be in medical trouble. My face reflected and betrayed nothing of the sort. I tried with equal effort to remove my left hand from the steering wheel to open the car door because by this point I wanted out. My left hand remained fixed as well, immovable. I started to panic. My legs moved freely and I could twist my body, but my hands would not let go. I struggled in the seat to extricate my hands, 
and then I heard something. It sounded like a child's laughter. My skin became taut, and I felt shivers in my torso. I desperately wanted out now. Hello? I shouted. Hello? The laughs echoed throughout the mansion in response. Through the windshield, a vision formed, an open, winding road. It appeared like a screen projection. What on earth is going on? I muttered aloud. Rain droplets began to patter on the dusty glass, and the car's windshield wiper spontaneously switched on. The child's voice laughed again, spry and playful in a horrifying way. Who's there? I demanded. The laughter intensified. I watched with morbid fascination the winding road that projected before me. It swayed like a venomous snake with its slithering curves. The chassis of the car reacted with each curve, the Shelby Mustang's body leaning from the G-forces, making my body shift in the seat. The illusion performed an elaborate dance, seductive in its realism and sickening with the sensation of velocity that overwhelmed my senses. Cold autumn air rushed in through the open window vent and it splashed over me, austere and chilling to my very soul. The rain intensified and the wipers could not keep up with the incessant downpour. The laughter outside the car reached a feverish pitch and then stopped. I saw a child in a yellow raincoat sprint in front of the car. I heard a violent thud and saw the body fly off to the curb. I felt an immediate fear, a seething terror that I had hit a child with my car. I wanted to flee the scene, to run away. I watched a faceless driver recover the body. The passenger door opened of its own volition. The seat next to me folded itself forward by a spectral hand and I watched the driver place the small translucent body to the back. The door closed and the road started to move again at an incredible rate of speed. I looked in the rear view mirror and saw the body of the child lying like a flimsy doll, bouncing and shifting with the irregularities of the road. I saw the owner park the car and remove the body. I saw the owner refinish the basement. Through the windshield, I watched the years go by in anonymity until advanced age and death swept the owner away along with any traces of what happened. I screamed to be let go. I screamed to be released from this prison, but my hands remained fixed to the three-spoke rim. I saw in my last conscious moments the ghost of this child appear at my driver's door and laugh maniacally the innocent face of youth melting away to show the tortured features of a spirit without rest or closure. This was the last thing I remember before waking up the next morning, stiff and sore. For minutes I lay conscious on the ground, my hands clutching the wooden handle of a sledgehammer. The Shelby from last night had vanished as if it had never existed. My automotive crown jewel was no more. Without any consideration, I got up and took a mighty swing of the sledgehammer smashing the concrete floor beneath me.